Welcome to a Million Baptist Podcast, where we discuss church life, theological questions, and cultural influences. Our podcasts are available via Google, Spotify, Apple, and many other podcast platforms. We hope you subscribe and enjoy today's episode. Hey everyone, welcome to another Amelia Baptist round table. I'm so thankful that we are able to uh, get together here and uh, have some more discussion sort of intermittently throughout the week. I'm joined by Dylan Whitaker. For those of you who uh, need the reminder, Dylan Whitaker is here on staff at ABC. Uh, he is our communications and IT guy. And so we really are appreciative of you, Dylan, and the time you give towards these round tables, as well as Clay, who's busy off in Orlando studying to be a brilliant award-winning filmmaker. Yes. Although, you know, he's been putting out vlogs, vlogs recently. Yeah, vlogs. And um, I haven't seen much studying being done on those vlogs. So he, I'm he not has sure. a lot of film yeah. of himself not studying <laughs> right. that he keeps putting out. You know, what we were thinking about sort of where to go in the trajectory. And we always have these ideas. We have a lot of questions that get asked. Um, it could be anything from... What are the, you know, what's the symbolism of keys in the Old and New Testament? Um, did Jesus really go down into hell in First Peter? We have a million of them, right? And we, and I really love the round tables that center upon those scriptures. And we pull out those scriptures and we bring in our pastor friends and me and Neil get into it. You and I get into it. And it just becomes really good discussion. And that's really what we want. It's not an online platform. It's an online presence, specifically during a time now where a lot of things are moving online from a church to recognize the personality and mission of that church where you're not as likely to visit right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes into what we want to talk about today in the sense that given the setting, given the timing, given um, when we release this round table uh, and, and kind of the season we're in, it would be almost silly to not talk about what's on everyone's minds, at least what ends up being the center of everybody's conversations. Yeah. And that is sort of obviously this new rise in Delta variant and of COVID-19 and sort of what that means for the church. And is there again, another battle when it comes to being a part of the body of believers and what can church leadership to do to sort of help ease this? And yeah. so we want to share some thoughts with you today. I think we were hoping that, you know, a year and a half after kind of the beginning of it, that we would be uh, not really talking about this. Um, so uh, I think it's a good topic to bring up again because we're still in it. Well, and, it does. And for those yeah. of you who need the reminder too, we're in Amelia Island, which is uh, Fernandina Beach, Florida. It's on the East Coast here, Northeast Florida, right on the Florida Georgia line. It's in Nassau County, which is uh, northern uh, around Duval County, a very popular county in Jacksonville, Florida, where, where I grew up. And in Nassau County and Duval County and all of the other counties in Florida, there has been a significant surge in Delta variant. I don't think that's the same for every state in the country right now, but we see possibilities. Um, yeah. A those, lot of tourism. Yes, yeah, a lot, a lot right of now. tourism, a lot of reasons mm -hmm. why that could be possible in Florida. But with that said, um, in March 2020, if you were living in Florida or any other state in the country, uh, you know, you were all told, uh, as, as myself included, that a few weeks and this would flatten the curve. Let's just shut down everything for a few weeks, flatten the curve, flatten the curve. And here we are, you know, a year and a half later, um, constant spread. Since then, we've had a shutdown, several shutdowns, mask mandates, uh, vaccinations, then reopenings, and now slow movement back to sort of what we were doing pre-March when it comes to church activity, church attendance, everything from baseball games to concert tours, everything was ready and open. Yeah. We have vaccinations out. So everybody's starting their lives again, you know, getting back into it. And then here we are with what looks like a very big setback yeah. that's at least freaking out our frontline workers and hospitals, our doctors and our nurses and our friends that we keep in contact mm -hmm. there as well. So particularly in the state of Florida, we see this rise, but this could very well happen across the country. And even the vaccinations don't stop one from contracting COVID, but most needing hospitalization right now are those who have not been vaccinated. That's what we know statistically. Mm -hmm. About 98, 99% of the hospitals are filled with unvaccinated people. And that's all we know. And all I talk about are the stats. But I don't want to dive into fields I'm not equipped to dive into. <laughs> I like you hopefully have medical professionals in your life that you can text and you can call and you can trust or people that you have been able to trust along the way. And I suggest we all have that. But the main question that Dylan and I sort of want to bring to the podcast today is how will COVID permanently change churches? What are some things we need to be on the lookout for? Yeah. Things like that. So hopefully this being a season 
And I want, I want to keep praying about that. I think the first thing we need to bring up is just prayer. Just be a praying people. Um, pray this is a season and not something that we're going to have to live with the rest of our lives. And again, this is not my field. We can all only trust the sovereign God we serve. Um, I do know smallpox straight up disappeared after five years. You know, there is mm-hmm. a possibility these things can end. Uh, but there's a good chance we may see COVID not only claim lives, but claim psyches. Now, you know what I mean by that? Yeah. Um, here are some areas of consideration for church leadership and church goers. And again, as we dive into these topics, I just want you to be free to message or communicate with us in any way, comment with any questions. We'd be happy to answer them. Um, that is the point of really all of this is to stay in communication. But Dylan, we are only looking at other churches or the communities or even across the country, but ours specifically. So what are some things happening in our church that we are taking proper precautions uh, for and what we're doing? Yeah. And, you know, uh, right now, uh, like you said, having a great team of uh, of medical personnel that we know personally uh, that are part of our church or uh, have, have been friends of ours that have been able to help us through and guide us uh, with this. We have a, a council of elders, which has been invaluable during this time mm-hmm. that are meeting and uh, making kind of the decisions, the tough decisions of, okay, biblically, how do we walk through this in love um, uh, for our congregation there? Um, you know, we've done, we do multiple cleanings. Mr. Stephen has been a great uh, at keeping our, our building safe, uh, you know, during our times here um, through dis- disinfecting uh, throughout the week. Um, there and uh, we've reduced the number, you know, of, of seats that we have in our in our um, sanctuary there. Yeah, we have uh, two we services, have two services, so that people, seats you know, can spread out cool. um, and and come through there. And that's been a great uh, great way to uh, to have some added precautions there hmm. um, as we deal with, you know, the challenges that we're in. Yeah, it's interesting too because as we talk about how we navigate through crisis any crisis, any season where the church can be affected greatly in negative ways. Um, one thing that we go back to are sort of some of the other topics we've discussed on the round table, like the purpose of elders mm-hmm. and how our heart really goes out to all of these pastors right now who are sort of finding themselves at their wits end because yeah. they're having to handle this pretty much by themselves. And they'll say, Oh, you know, I have my deacons around me and praise God for that. I'm so glad that you do have that accountability. But when you share the burden with other ordained elders and other pastors, it's not just one man leading that church. And so I don't want to get too into that as a separate topic. But again, we're sort of seeing why we wanted to set this up and why the Bible sets this up as proper offices. Yeah. Uh, and of if the people haven't heard that, there's always we dealt with it several uh, episodes on our roundtable uh, last right. year. So go back and, and there are elder episodes, uh, elder episodes. Right. We talked so. about um, the importance of having uh, con- being congregationalists, mm-hmm. um, understanding from a polity sense, yep. why we want to hear from our people, uh, how this creates more of a family dynamic within the church. And we know that some people are going to be in different in size. And so mm-hmm. our well, the biggest uh, it's ever been, never in attendance this size on a given Sunday, but a well of people can be well over 350 people here. Um, but we probably have an active church of about 300 people, I would say, where we're going to see them some way, some week during the month. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do want to mention that our warnings to the congregation have been met with real grace that as you're leading your church through this crisis, to me, the key world, the key word, no matter what's being done or what's being said is grace. And you can add mercy to that and you can add patience to that and all of those other Christ-like characteristics, yeah. because if you're not walking this out with some serious long-term perspective, you cannot get through this season with your week to week logic mm-hmm. and your week to week, this should happen, but it didn't, or I can't believe that they didn't do this, but they should, you will end up really freaking out on a regular basis. If you don't see this for what it really is, which is a long ball game yeah Making with a lot of different changing uh, constant changes uh, you know uh, statistics and and <sighs> guidelines and trying to stay up on top of you know what's right. now the the current uh deal with this virus here so right and again and i'm human here and i know you have been too what's killing me is sort of the lack of just logic at times and and here's the big big deal though as you're leading your church don't remember don't forget that you can't make anybody 
do anything and that you yourself are also very limited with the info, info on any given day. So there's a lot of humility as you walk out this, this plenty of room for grace in your leadership, giving your people tons of grace, understanding that you are trusting them as they are trusting you to do what's best for their family. It reminds me of always thinking the best about our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and that being a biblical commandment right now. And I think we need a lot of that. So like Dylan said, some of the things we're doing, if you're listening and you're a church of 300 or less in size, um, any, any given Sunday, uh, we have moved to two services. We did that when we came back from the first shutdown. We have been needing to do that for a long time, but we went ahead and just did that. And it gave people plenty of room and, uh, to social distance. The first service is less attended than the second one. We have about 200 seats on the floor for each service. There has been a choir break even recently, but we've also stopped the worship choir in some cases in the back in, in the last year and a half, as well as we've we spent almost 10 months singing outside. Yeah. And we were able to do that being in Amelia Island. We'd end the service on song, so it wasn't how I prefer it, which is sort of sprinkled along the worship service. Right. I like a song study, song study, song prayer kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But it's okay. It, was, it worked. Uh, it kept a lot of us... Uh, from uh, catching this thing based on the aerosols, we believe, you know, it was just kind of a good precaution to take and something we could do. And then uh, now, right now, we're still singing at the end of the service. Yeah. But one thing I want to make sure we talk about, because I know there's going to be people listening that, that are kind of stuck and lost, and that's who I really want to speak to. And it's not just pastors. It's not just leadership. It's, it's people who are wanting to know whether they can go to church or not mm-hmm. right now. And medically, I don't have anything for them because I think this is going to come down to make you individually making the best decision for you and your family. That is my sort of go-to position. But I think there's some things that the church can be doing to sort of guide and help during this period of time, during this season. You're going to see us, see us uh, integrating that um, family equipping model with the responsibility of the church um, and and encouraging and equipping families to make the best decision for their, uh, you know, their kids and their wives and their, you know, husbands and, so on and so forth. So. Yeah, you can have unity in mm-hmm. a church without having uniformity. Those yeah. are two totally different things. And I think we've gotten those confused a bit. It's mm-hmm. like if everybody's not doing the same thing or thinking the same thing about the virus, then, you know, then I, obviously we're somebody's off. Split, yeah. Right. You know, and this is just divisive. Well, of course it's divisive. Everything's divisive. And then when you start getting people's opinions thrown in the matter, it can only get more divisive right. because we all have our issues. But I think ultimately trust, grace, understanding your church. You've led them the best you can. You, you're teaching the word faithfully. Mm-hmm. There's a sense of, look, we know what the Bible commands us to do, and we've got to stick to those commands yeah. um, the best we can. And so this is what we're going to get to. But the first thing I want to talk to to you about, Dylan, is sort of how important, how vital was that online push that we gave. And by that, I mean, live streaming the services, uh, developing ways to talk and discuss uh, things throughout the week to keep people um, connected during a time of complete shutdown. That's when we started the round tables and we've okay. kept those going because people have requested them and we've gotten a good bit of views from them and we're getting listeners on our podcast platforms, which we love and we enjoy doing this because most of the time we don't have to talk about COVID. Right. Most of the time we can talk about things we actually like talking about. This is not our favorite uh, <laughs> round table this week, but <laughs> this was like necessary. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in terms of online services, you were, you were integral in that process and the church, um, decided during congregational meetings to put forth the appropriate finances so that you'd have the equipment that you needed and you've led a team in that. So we broadcast live our 10 45 AM service yes. and uh, we get a good amount of accounts to watch that live. And then that increases in views, uh, over time over the next week or so. So people are catching that. But how important do you think it is for churches to start really considering having a live stream or a recorded service that people can see and watch uh, sometime either on Sunday or the next day? People are doing different things. What's your take on that? You know, I think uh, online service, there's there's pros and cons to it. And um, I think we need to understand that within online uh, uh, viewing and stuff like that, there is an aspect that's missing. And that's the uh, the command that we have biblically to gather together as, as believers mm-hmm. in person. Um, but in a time of uncertainty, like we have been in with COVID, where there have been people who are at risk, um, uh, you know, we know multiple people in our congregation who just have not been able to come. Um, uh, and I think it's been great to be able to still have that fellowship um, you know, with them through an online service, you know, every Sunday, 
I'm in the back and I see them pop on to the, you know, Facebook or YouTube page and like, you know, this family's watching and able to just come comment back and like, we miss you, but so glad you're here. Mm -hmm. Gives that little bit of connection. You know, they're still connecting to our church body as a family. Um, and then, you know, going, looking forward in the future, even outside of COVID, um, the online realm is only going to grow. It's, I mean, we're in a time where online is where we're headed, you know, whether it's shopping online, um, whether I know, it's I took learning, my, my wife you know, and I had an 11th anniversary, 11th year anniversary on Friday. And I took her to the St. John's town center and in my head, I'm thinking, Oh, well, she'll mall, like this. Right? She get, yeah, the mall. And so I'm <laughs> thinking, mall? yeah, right. And so I'm thinking she'll go, she'll enjoy this because usually we have three beautiful babies around yelling at us. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't get to enjoy like just walking around. Yeah. So I'm like, and I have Barnes and Noble and the Lego store. So I'll be perfectly satisfied until she's ready to go. Right. And so she, I parked the car and she just put her hand on my shoulder and said, honey, I have, I just need to tell you that things have changed since we first got married. I have no interest in, in going window, to, <laughs> window yeah. shopping anymore. Right. I'm kind of a, if I need something, I'll go to the store and get it. And I just sort of was like, I didn't, you never communicated that. Like I didn't know yeah. that was, and maybe you did and I wasn't listening very possible, but it's very true that she's just kind of out of that sense mm -hmm. of, and she's like, if I need something, I'll just order it. Mm -hmm. And it just pointed to the fact that, you know, this is not new news. This is where we are as yeah. people. But I think as Christians and as the church, I'm feeling more and more sort of challenged to, remind people of the importance of being together mm -hmm. kind of a pro relationship pro face to face before we all turn out as the people in wally -E. you know what i mean like it's got to be a sense right. of i don't want to be alone in my wi-fi pods mm -hmm. you know kind of just cut off the world thinking that i'm social and it comes back to what we talked about about the ways the phone's changing you that's another yeah. round table we did and about how you can think you're very social when you're mm -hmm. very alone. And so I don't want the online services of each church to do that. Cause I think there are some pastors who are very hesitant yeah. to put everything online because they know people will never come back. And mm -hmm. that was what I heard at the very beginning, which is yeah. like, why would I do that? Why would we put all this effort into it? They'll do that forever. Well, look, you can't really stop someone from doing that. Yeah. You can't control people. Actions right. and so putting it online allows them to see who you are as a church. I think that's something yeah. that we've come to realize more and more right. is that it gives people the ability to really just click on. Um, instead of people walking into your churches now, people are going online to search. It's yeah. kind of like you go online to look at a review, and it sounds bad, yeah. Um, in in some ways, but a lot you know, a lot of times when people are are looking for a, a place to call home. Uh, they'll go online first. No, I agree. And that's that's you know, obvious. Listen to your sermons and People stuff like that. People have sites so. forever. I think right now you're just starting to understand that you really need to have not a platform, but a place mm -hmm. online that people can, can have if they can't come or if they don't feel comfortable coming and just continue talking and preaching yeah. the truth about the gospel and about what the charge is to the Christian church. If you're faithful and loyal to that, they'll hear that and they're able to make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. That's their will, man. So yep. there's just a lot of that where I don't see a lot of people going, you know, oh, I, they're not doing live stream. I guess I'll have to go into Sunday morning now. You know, like right. I don't, I don't have a lot of those conversations. Typically, there are people who are just not interested yeah. in coming, and maybe come every once in a while to sort of check some some box. Yeah. And that, most of the people that are watching our our service on Sunday mornings, they're dying to be with us in person. That's what I love you know? about the familial and context. So, that's what the family feel, the pro and mm -hmm. con in the COVID world. Because one thing I've seen, um, Robbie Galati is a pastor at Long Hollow. Uh, I think it's in Tennessee, but he has had his, all of his care ministries moved to zoom temporarily. And so mm -hmm. they have divorce care and abortion care and all this stuff. They used to meet in person throughout the church. Right now they're meeting on zoom. If those are temporary, I see no problem in utilizing tech for yeah. those things. I don't think it hurts your family feel and what you're trying to do. Now his church is like 10,000 people. Right, right. So there's a lot of difference <laughs> in that. I don't think every church is equipped nor financially capable of doing everything that we've talked about. But I think it really does come down to connecting and being actual pastors of your congregation mm -hmm. instead of just platform preachers and expecting all the Sunday school teachers or the deacons to do all the pastoral work. This right. is about really getting to know your body of believers to a point where your family is being held together because your family is stronger mm -hmm. than some COVID season. Um, one thing I've done more than anything in the last year and a half are these phone calls and texts and emails. Just most of my week now, 
is probably doing the communication I needed to be doing prior to COVID. Yeah. Kind of doing see, my you job. You see why God had you get a communication <laughs> degree before? I see why God had me hire someone who's better at communications than I am. More important. I wouldn't say that. But community matters. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Lord has commanded the body of believers to gather. Yeah. That is not online. Right. That is not what that means. But you're going to have your cases where someone has an autoimmune disorder. Someone really wants to be there. That's when you go back to Jesus's teachings of the heart of the matter. What stops us from being self-righteous religious people that say you need to come to church no matter what. Start using wisdom as well as grace as you navigate this. Really looking at your heart. Right. Are you everywhere but church and then saying you can't go to church because of COVID? Yeah. That's a heart problem. Yeah. That's that's fear over faith. Yeah. So those are some situations that become introspective that you need to sort of yeah. ask. And this leads us into a question the world wants to know, mm-hmm. Adam, is are you going to shut down your church again? Because as mm-hmm. cases start to rise, I think one of the questions that is looked at from a, the world standpoint is, well, you're gathering. And, you know, you, uh, one of the arguments is there's the possibility for a spread uh, in your church if you can keep meeting. So the as a pastor, how would you answer or encourage uh, other pastors as they look at this when they say, will you close your church again um, during a time of, of you know, uh, uncertainty that we're going into? Yeah. Again? So like the first question I would ask is, what's my conversation with my local government? Mm-hmm. Is this statewide? Is this from, you know, the executive office? What, what, is, what are they actually saying? So right. we have our situation in Canada where they're, the government's telling the churches to not open at all. Yeah, you can't and, open. And pat, like not, not open, to not open their doors in several parts, in several regions of Canada. And people are doing it. Yeah. And they're getting arrested for it. Yeah. Pastors, Pastors are. Pastors are going to jail right across the border from right. us. So that, that is a reality. Yeah. yeah. And the bottom line is, um, without sounding, you know, a bit too wave my flag, you know, <laughs> aggressive, masculine. Oh, no, uh, you would never do that no, at all. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to close down ever. Mm. Um, and I don't think that's really a good answer to the question because I don't think any good pastor should want to close down right. ever on a Sunday. I hope, and I'll say this, God willing, I will be here to preach every Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. Um, and by that, I mean, if the government tells me to shut down, I'm going to have a serious problem obeying that. Mm-hmm and obeying my Lord, because this is my point. I feel like we should be able to work with our local governments and say, if you want me to issue a serious warning to my congregants, if I love them and I agree and see the stats that this is a health issue that they could, you know, really need to pay attention to this. And if it's just for a few weeks or, you know, maybe at most a month or something, we can get through this. We're strong enough for that. But I need to be there with the doors open on Sunday morning. There needs to be a time per week where I need to be there as a pastor to be there for anyone who wanders in who has a question. Why? Because this is an eternal matter, not a temporal one. Because souls are at stake, not just our health. Because at any given time, someone feels like a church is open on Sunday morning and they walk in and they have questions about Christ Jesus as Savior and Lord. It is my responsibility as someone who has been called Mm -hmm. by Jesus Christ to be a pastor, by the Lord to be a pastor, is our belief to be there for that person. Yeah. That's not stubbornness. That's not saying, man, you wouldn't do this if there was a massive hurricane. Um, I think my chances of having someone come up to the church during a massive hurricane, hurricane, unless they needed shelter church really should still be open. Yeah. Uh, the, but the idea here during a perfect day, but we are uh, concerned about COVID, which we should be in part, um, to shut down a church, uh, at any time. I just don't see that it's that anything but a, a violation of separation of church and state. So we will warn, but until they specifically need to come in and remove us, I will gather for, with my family on Sunday mornings and be there for a congregation who wants to attend. Um, and I don't have any disagreement or, or real hate for any brothers who, who are shutting down when they see a case or look, everybody's having to walk this thing out the best they know how. And it's a brand new situation is a com- personal conviction I've gathered through scripture to just remind myself that this world is just a waiting room Mm -hmm. and we all need more eternal perspective and focus. And I think the key is like you said, short term versus a long term. you know, what are, what are we doing? Are we, are we taking precautions short term here or is this something that is dragging out, you know, month after month, year after year. Um, and you're saying, okay, well this is happening, but then at the same time we have this biblical command to gather together. How do we reconcile these? Right. Um, and that's where you're, you're running into a little bit of the tricky issues. Right. There. And speaking of the next couple of years, I do think pastors need to be aware as well as ministry leaders and uh, people who are teaching Sunday school classes, anyone who's really involved in local church or small group leaders, 
uh, you're dealing with serious fear here. Um, some people are panicking over this and some people have seen more than we've seen, especially our frontline workers. And we just need to understand that all we can really do is trust the Lord and do our best because you will see this is not going to end when the disease ends. Yeah. There's going to be a fear that lingers. There's going to be a, a tra- traumatic response to disease, phobias yeah. created. Um, and all of this is going to cause division because then where you have phobia and you have trauma, you always have blame. And there's going to be people who want to blame other people and other things because they always need an answer to everything that occurs. They always need a reason so they can better control the situation instead of alleviating all of that control and giving it to their Lord. Mm -hmm. So it is a reflection of what is inside mankind, the division that COVID can cause. All of that is not because of COVID. All of that is because mankind is mankind. We're just seeing it manifested. We just see it manifested and brought about by Mm -hmm. COVID. You're seeing ugliness. That ain't the disease. That's a man's nature. What you're seeing is the reason for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a reason we're going to continue to preach the gospel from the pulpit on Sunday morning. (laughs) Sort of all works together that way. Um, But look at the next couple years to end on some sort of application and some advice. Uh, Here's what we know about trauma. The hard part comes later on when it comes to trauma. So if this season has been traumatic for people, the worst part is going to come out in the next couple of years. It's not even going to be be uh, present time. It's going to be the next couple of years. And you have to kind of ask, is your church prepared to shepherd and disciple people who are having trouble getting out of depression and anxiety, Mm -hmm. having trouble being around other people without thinking they may get some kind of serious illness. This can claim psyches, Mm -hmm. not just lives. This can claim perspectives. So we have to guard our minds with the righteousness of Christ, be in the word probably now more than ever when it comes to something like this and really let him flood our thoughts, let his promise flood our thoughts. Um, I I'm personally optimistic Mm -hmm. about our future. I want to choose that. I'm not naturally optimistic person, uh, as many can attest to. I'm cautiously (laughs) optimistic because, uh, the book of acts and church history tells us that whenever something like this happens, the Christians that remain. And by that, I mean, who are in it for the long haul, Mm -hmm. not just those who come to church because we know good, solid believers in Christ who are just making wise decisions for their families by not being around right now but are dying to come back. They really are. What I mean is when this refines, when the fire refines and you have people who have been playing church for years, who have been cultural Christians uh, undercover as Bible-believing, going to church, 401k suburb-living Christians, when all of that hits the fan, you have an idea that Christ is building his church under that oppression because he always has. It's always taken something to refine the fire to to purify the church. So I'm looking forward to see how the Lord is at work in all of it because, again, historically, the church grows under adversity and maybe the church in America, I don't like to say the American church, but the church in America needed the wake-up call just to see who we really are when our grasp on the temporary world is tested and our relationships are tested. So I think this is a time to shine. What do you think? Yeah, I would uh, I would add on to that and encourage um, people to live intentionally in a time of uncertainty. In the sense of, uh, you know, one That's thing good. we heard a lot at the beginning was the the idea. Of, well, when we get past COVID and everything goes back to normal, this is what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're now a year and a half into this, and if we continue to live that way. We're going to just sit around waiting for things to change. Um, And that's not God's will for us. That's not our calling. In this time, he still, our our mission hasn't changed. Our purpose hasn't changed. As believers, we're called to share the gospel. We're called to be, make disciples. Um, We're called to love our our wives, our kids, our families, our neighbors as ourselves. Um, And so within that, are we being intentional about that? Even from our homes, Mm -hmm. um, even in our online communication, we have an online platform. We are connected to people. How are we using that platform to uh, continue to live and Mm -hmm. to share uh, the gospel? So I'd say within this time, uh, even if it is a temporary time, let's live intentionally um, in a time of uncertainty. I like that a lot. I like that. And as a reminder to everybody, remember, um, like God did with the gospel when he saved our lives through Christ, we are called to meet people that we are ministering to where they are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we have to leave the truth at home or pander to uh, weaknesses. It just means that we are meeting people where they are. And that means less of us and more of Jesus. So this is a time for grace, self-control, wisdom, and faith over fear. As we navigate all these idiosyncrasies and variables 
And as we pray for you out there, continue to pray for us. And I promise you, God will not have his hand off his people. Yeah. Uh, he will always be there for his sons and daughters and for the church, no matter what's going on. So we just need to make sure our faith and trust is in him above all else. And we would discuss and talk uh, about anything else that needs to be talked about. I'm looking forward to next week's conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting to take this week right. by week. But yeah. uh, Dylan, I appreciate you, brother. Yes. Uh, thanks for joining you us. Too. Hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful week. And we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you soon. God bless. Da 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 da